Hello. Okay, the last talk slot of the day and of the conference. Very exciting. Um, it looks like I have a little bit of text cut off there. I'm not sure what's causing that. Did other people have this problem? Yes? It's normal? Change. Well, that's going to get really ugly, I'm afraid. Uh, I don't think I have anything really at the bottom, so hopefully it'll be fine. Uh, no one wants to make an announcement before we start? Something about a drawing of some type? So. Some of you may have uh, had an opportunity to look at the Enterprise DB table at your registration and notice the uh, sign in the uh, jar to enter yourself for a, uh, a free virtual training class to be announced here. So a couple of you put your business cards in and I'll uh, go ahead and pick one out. And uh, if you're not here right now, you'll uh, get an email. Winner is uh, Faisal Akbar of uh, VMware. So is Faisal in here anywhere? Okay, well, he'll find out another way. Thank you. Great, great, thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is Bruce Momjan. Um, work for Enterprise DB. I'm one of the core team members. Been working on Postgres since 1996. Um, I'm excited to be giving this talk. And uh, frankly, I don't know about any of you, but uh, this is, in terms of quality of talks, this, con this PGCon has been the best PGCon that I can remember uh, pretty much, uh, I don't know, forever, maybe for the last four or five years. So I don't know. The quality, there have been some previous years where there have been, like, there was one talk that just, like, knocked me out of my seat. Um, this one, it was, like, virtually every talk I went to was very high quality very pointed at exactly what I was interested in. I'm not sure. I talked to some other people. They sort of felt the same way. So it would be interesting for the organizers to see if we get that feedback. So please do give us feedback. If there's some things that we can do to improve. I know we're all interested in, in finding that out. So today, uh, what I want to talk about is um, effectively the Postgres Query Optimizer. Uh, this is a very interesting topic to me. In fact, this is the reason I got involved with Postgres, because in 1996, I had been writing uh, financial applications for seven years. And you know, after you write financial applications for about seven years, you're really not learning a whole lot anymore. And as a professional, I felt like I wanted to learn more. I wanted to understand more about what I was doing. And I, because I was writing database applications, occasionally I would get to look inside of the database to see how was a query that I sent to the server actually executed? What, how is it making its decisions and, and, and how is it returning those results as efficiently as possible? And at that time, I was using Informix and um, uh, Ingress, and I was not able to see really inside of how they made those decisions. I could kind of see a little bit of the plan that came out, if you're familiar with those products or other products that generate a plan. But, but I couldn't actually look at the code or understand the process it was using to make those decisions. And one of the real attractions of Postgres, and one of the reasons I got involved in sort of starting it in internet development in 1996 was because of that openness of code, and because I could actually understand it. Now, I'm not going to actually be talking about the internal code of what goes on in Postgres too much today. Um, but what I am going to do is kind of walk you through basically how Postgres makes those decisions and give you a little more appreciation of what is going on inside that server. Um, I know a lot of people are sort of keen on, you know, non-relational systems these days and, and sort of looking at things that don't have an optimizer. But I think one of the things you're going to get out is understanding how much of that optimizer helps you as an application developer not have to worry about a lot of the intricacies that um, you normally would have had to work deal with before relational systems came around. Um, so you know, simply, when you're writing an application, as, as you would be uh, here, um, usually you have some kind of interface layer that sends the query across to the server. And then 
sends the result back to the interface layer and then up into the application. We're going to basically be focusing on what happens inside that server, that part to the right. So internally, uh, Postgres effectively has a sort of an, an internal flow that it goes through to figure out how to execute a query. Uh, and in fact, the most important part of that flow is what we call the optimizer or the planner. Now, that's not the first section that actually occurs. When a query comes in, the first thing that happens, again, coming in from the top here, the first thing that happens is the statement's parsed. It's broken down into words, and then the words are then uh, treated as tokens or lexemes, which are then passed to something called a lexer, which effectively generates actions based on the pattern of tokens or keywords that come in, um, that have come into the, to the parser. Uh, there's then a traffic cop in Postgres, which figures out if it's a utility command or not. If it's not a utility command, it goes into something called a rewriter, which is where we handle things like views and, um, and rules. Uh, but down after the rewriter is that optimizer. Um, effectively, what it's doing, it's trying to figure out how can I get that user the results as quickly as possible. And then what comes out of that execute, um, optimizer is something called a plan. The plan effectively is sent to the executor, and that's the part that actually executes the query. So this is sort of the, the map maker, the one who lays out the plan of what we're going to do, and that's effectively passed into the executor, which is really just uh, something that, uh, that, that, that follows whatever plan came out of the optimizer. So it's really just executing a recipe uh, that's come out. So we're going to focus on that optimizer, what I think of as the brains of the system. What things does that optimizer have to do? What things does it have to decide? There's three major areas that it has to make decisions on. One, um, what is the scan method that's going to be used to get at the data? And I'm going to go in specifics about what scan methods are available in Postgres. Secondly, what join methods are going to use? We're going to talk, show you specific examples with diagrams and show you exactly what join methods are there. And then finally, join order. That's sort of figuring out, do I join table A to B and then C, or do I join table B and C and then A? You know what I'm saying? Different orders of, of bringing things together. And I'm going to show you specific examples here. Now, you might not be using Postgres, or you might be using Postgres plus some other relational systems. These concepts are very generic. So in most, most relational systems, you will see the same concepts the terms might be slightly different. There might be a couple other things that aren't there. But this should be, these, are be, these are very generic relational concepts. So first thing, uh, scan methods. Uh, there's basically three types of scan methods supported um, in Postgres. And again, deciding which one to use is something I'm going to show you in a, in a couple minutes. Uh, the first one is called, um, but, but, but let's, let's, let's first, before we do that, let's set it up. So first what we have to do is we have to create a little like temporary table so I can illustrate all the things I'm going to talk about. So effectively what I've done here is I've just run a little query that goes into the system catalogs and just pulls out some of the relation names in the system. Um, and, and then what I did next is I took the relation names and I chopped off just the first letter. I just chopped off everything else to the first letter, just got rid of it. Okay? And then I created a temporary table with, the, with this contents. So effectively what I did was I took the, 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 the system table, then I chopped off, I just took the first letter of the relation name, and then I put a bunch of junk at the end and I created a table called sample and I put an index on it. That's all I did. Okay, because I'm going to use this example for the next probably 10 slides, and this can kind of give you an idea of how this is going to work. Now, if you want to run this yourself, the, the part in pink here is actually, this is actually the SQL. So if you want to download this, you can run it, and you can actually see it running on your terminal, and you can actually see the exact same output. Um, there have a bunch of slides on my website. In fact, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it. And the reason I didn't mention it now that I realize it is because it's chopped off at the bottom. Um, but effectively, if you go to uh, this website right here and get rid of that rest of the part there, this, this right here, um, if you go under presentations, there's pro this presentation is there, and then there's 30 other presentations also there. They're in PDFs, and you know the bottom isn't chopped off. So you'll, if you're missing the bottom there, you can, uh, you can definitely check that out 
uh, on that website. So that's the, this is the temporary table we're going to use. And then we're going to also use a function that I used a little bit to display things a little better. Again, this is also in the SQL file. Um, so let's see, what, what does this file look like? I created a temporary file, and I made a little query, and I said, just tell me what this looks like, this temporary table. Um, so effectively, I have, um, I think there's about 253 rows in this table. I can tell when I created the temp table. Um, 199 of them have a P, just the letter P in it, and then another field which has a bunch of junk on it. I have nine of them, which is an S, and then eight of them, which is C, and then down here I have one row, which is an I, and one row is a K. And the reason I created this is because it gives me a nice distribution of a variable kind of case where I've got one letter, which is really common in the system, a couple of letters which are really common, and then I've got two letters, which are a bunch of letters, which are very rare. And this is the type of case that you have in relational systems. This is one of the areas the optimizer does very well, is it kind of can adjust things based on how selective your data is. Uh, and I'm going to go into how that happens in a minute. Okay? So what do, what do I mean by selective? Okay? So if I just do this query right here and I say, give me a P, okay, um, what it actually ends up doing is something called an index scan, which like, okay, so what if I use, that's, a very, that's, my, that's my most common value, right? So what if I do a D, which happens to be uh, kind of in the middle here. I've got four of those. And that's also an index scan. And, and what if I do a K? Well, that's also, that's my rarest value. And it's doing the same thing. I'm doing, I got an index scan for all three values. For my most popular value and my least popular value, they're all returning the same thing. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is, is because I don't have any statistics on the table. Uh, what statistics are, are uh, what we have a special thing called optimizer statistics. And the optimizer statistics tell the optimizer how common certain letters are or certain values are within a table. So normally there's something called auto and auto vacuum, which will run and analyze for you, but that runs like every minute, so I might not want to wait for the minute for it to run. And in this case, I'm using temporary tables, which auto vacuum can't even see, so that doesn't help me. So I've got to run the analyze myself. And I just went and I ran that analyze right there at the top. And as soon as I run that analyze, you see a change right away. That P, which used to be an index scan, is now a sequential scan. Okay. And a sequential scan is effectively saying, start at the beginning of the table, read all the rows to the end of the table. Very straightforward, very just, you know, read everything. Very easy. This is the easiest one to understand. Now, why did you choose an index, a sequential scan? That's because we showed up here that 78% of our rows were Ps. So, you know, if 78% of your rows are Ps, it doesn't make any sense to do all sorts of index lookups to somehow eliminate 22% of your rows. Doesn't make sense. So we're just going to read straight through the table. That's the way to go. Okay. What, what happens if I do a D? Now, the D, I have four of those. Okay, and the D ends up giving me something different. It gives me what's called a bitmap heap scan. Sounds kind of weird, but what it effectively is doing is it's going through the index and it's creating a bitmap that tells me where can I potentially find matching rows in the heap. And I'm going to put a 1 every place I can and a 0 any place I don't, I'm not going to find it. So effectively what I do is instead of doing four accesses, I'm going to go through the index once, it's going to give me, make a little bitmap, and then I'm going to walk through the bitmap. Now this is probably overkill for this case, but again, because there were four, it decided to create a bitmap and then use that to kind of aggregate all the lookups into the heap. Um, if I do the K, which there's only one of, I actually get an index scan, straight index scan, with, with no bitmap, because there's no need for a bitmap because it knows there's only one, or at least the statistics are telling it that there's only one match. It's going to go through the B tree. It's going to find the row. We're done. Okay. So this is the first example showing how the optimizer statistics 
are effectively changing how we go at our data. All right? And again, as an application developer, you don't have to worry about, oh, am I querying something that's very common or am I not? And this happens all the time. If, you know, if, I, um, if I'm uh, you know, in Ottawa and I'm querying all my customers in Ottawa, well, I may probably have a lot of customers in Ottawa, so I'm probably going to just do a sequential scan of all my customers. But if I have an index on, this, on the, the, the province and I try and, you know, I try and query somebody um, in uh, Manitoba, which I actually know is a province in Canada, amazingly, from my education years ago. Am I right? Uh, it is one of them, yes. Um, don't hear about it very much. I'm not sure why. Um, but if I wanted to say how many customers I have in Manitoba and I've got an index on province, odds are I'm going to use an index there. Because there's probably only a couple, because I don't think there's that many people in Manitoba. Do we have anybody from Manitoba here? Somebody, I, I'm, I'm disappointed. Anyway, um, somebody can probably give me a good history lesson the day after and tell me what is there, um, because I'm always fascinated by Canada. But anyway, um, no, I, I think it's really, a really great country. So let's take a look at a better description of this, OK? So what I did was I just did some random letters, right? I just did three letters, and I kind of showed you. So what I did was I created a little kind of query here, and I'm actually using a little function that I used. And I'm getting this output. But if I kind of query it a little differently, again, all these queries are in that SQL file, I get this. And this, to me, is the, kind of the, the quintessential slide for the presentation. Because what it's illustrating is that as I, change, as I go from the most common values at the top to the least common values at the bottom, the optimizer is automatically changing the type of access method it uses to get at the data automatically with me not having to do anything at all to the query itself. Okay? And this is all driven by the analyzed statistics that I created early on. Are there any questions so far? Yes, sir. So I would have expected the sequential scan to only be on that first row. Why is it doing the nine into that row, but then not five? So the question is, why is the sequential scan actually doing it not only for 199, but all the way down to the R, which is number seven, and then down? That is a very common question, because most people think that the index should be used if it's selective Sort of. So they'll basically say, well, you know, I understand if 78% of my rows are P's, I probably don't want to use an index. But you know, if it's 30%, I think that index sounds pretty good. But then when you realize that the index has a root page and then different like sub pages to get to the thing, and then you realize that, you know, that you're going to have to randomly go through, you're going to have to randomly hit the heat pages. Now, of course, if you use a bitmap scan, you can kind of do them in order, but you're going to be hopping between. The bottom line is that random I.O. is really slow, and sequential I.O. is really fast. Okay? So the, the, the sort of dirty secret is that like, an index almost has to be like under 5% selected before it gets starts to be used. And that's effectively designed because of the way that the costs are set up in Postgres and, and, the, and the type of the way we know we have to do multiple reads to get through that index to get to the row. Whereas when we do a sequential, we know we're just like, not only are we reading like straight through, but the, uh, the, the kernel is prefetching ahead of us because it knows we're going sequentially. Um, so is 5% a good rule of thumb at any scale? So is 5 a good rule of thumb at any scale? Um, not really. I mean, the, the number actually goes down as the table gets bigger, but usually 5 7% is about the number we're going to see. Now, that kind of breaks pretty close because this, the 5, I said there were 250 rows in the table, so 253. So a 5 is what? That's 2%? Yeah. So that's actually breaking, I would say, much lower than that. Now, the 7 is probably around 4%, four, three and a half, something like that. So again, I think the, the number's breaking a little even lower than 5%. I might be even generous. And, and it continues to surprise me how low that number really is. 
Now, if you think I'm making that up, which you could, okay, um, well, actually, uh, uh, the way I'm doing it is going to fake it, but I want to show you something. What if I tell it, what if I force it to do an index scan? I say, I don't believe you, optimizer. I am going to turn off sequential scan with that top line. I'm going to turn off bitmap scan with the next line, and I am going to force an index scan. I'm sorry, I'm going to turn off bitmap scan and sequential scan, and I'm going to run that again. And what you see is that when you look at the cost, the cost down here was around eight, which this is the same because these were index scans before anyway. But then as you get up, it goes to 12, it goes to 15, it goes to 19. Ends up when you get up here at 39. The original output, which is this one, again, starts at eight, goes to 11, but it really doesn't go any, it goes up to 13, okay? Now, if you think the optimizer is doing something wrong, you can turn it off using these commands at the top, and you can rerun your query and time it and tell us, is, are we wrong or not, okay? In almost every case when somebody actually, we have an FAQ item that even talks about, why is my index not being used? This is a very common question. Um, and it actually shows you these commands, how to turn it off, and it says run it with it, run it without it, tell us what you get, and the questions magically disappear. It's amazing. Uh, we put something in the FAQ, and then within six months, uh, we don't get the questions anymore. Does, is the system perfect all the time? No. But, but overall, the costing is pretty accurate, and we don't seem to have too much, it's almost counterintuitive how low that breakpoint is. Um, and you can adjust it. If you have SSDs, you can adjust the random page cost. So there are some things you might need to adjust if, if, if these numbers, in t if these estimates, in fact, are wrong. Um, but in most cases, it gets it pretty close. And I saw a question over here. Mr. Hibb. Yeah, you know, that's what I was, I was getting to, that I'm actually cheating. And the cheating is that these numbers are actually the costs that the optimizer is giving us. These are not actual execution times. So I could have expanded this and kind of done the full execution time on this. I, I didn't do that. Um, partially because the numbers would float around, and then also partially because you start to get caching effects when you have multiple, because when you run it once, it's not in cache, and when you run it again, it is in cache. So the numbers have a tendency to float around, and it's kind of hard to get really accurate numbers in that case. Yes, sir? Do we find that the, uh, the percentages actually increase if the table gets much wider? Though? So do we find if the percentages increase if the table gets much wider? In fact, there's um, what you can't see over here, uh, and maybe I do need to change my resolution. I don't know. What resolution is this thing? We don't know. OK. Uh, anyway, what, what's over here uh, is actually a width estimate. So the optimizer knows how wide the row is, an estimate of how wide the row is, and it will actually adjust it based on that. So a shorter row will have a tendency to be looked up differently. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir, or ma'am. Sorry. Does the optimizer take into account a Does the optimizer take into account a clustered index? Yes, it does. Um, when you issue the cluster command, the next analyze operation will actually sample the cluster ratio for the table. And because the cluster is not maintained, uh, you have to recluster it, 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 the, the clustering order. Effectively, every time an analyzer is run, there is a special index that is marked as the clustered index in the system tables. And it will actually randomly sample and it will update that amount of clustering ratio in, this, in the statistics, and that will be used to determine how, lo how localized a lookup is, particularly if you're looking up like a P or a D where you, you think, is it spread in five to four different places on the table, or is it maybe all in one page? Um, so in fact, the, the not, only it's, not only do we record it, but we actually keep it updated and the ratio will decrease as the clustering gets dispersed within the table. Other questions? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I was just going to say that I think that 
table is so compact that the choice of scan doesn't really matter for this case. Yeah, this, this is a contrived. Everything fits on one page. He's saying it's kind of contrived, and, and I will admit, yes, that is, that's true. It, it, normally, I would have taken a huge data set and run a huge thing, but then the problem is the numbers are so huge that you can't really conceptually get at it. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's already in memory, so it doesn't matter. Yes. So, um, will the planner to decide whether it's sequential scan or bitmap or, or index scan? Um, if you've got an index that is actually indexed in two or three columns, will yep. it consider all the values? Like, does the, uh, the, do the statistics com have combinations of values? So, the statistics have combinations of values, or just, but if you have a multi column index, does it, does it look at the combo of that? Unfortunately, well, fortunately, it actually indexes every column. So whether the column is in an index or not in an index, it's going to index them all. Because a lot of times, you're going to say A equals 1, B equals 12. And that B, although it may not be indexed, could be very important. And, and we need to know how selective that is to determine how many rows are going to come out, which is actually part of the later part where we talk about how we join the data. So, we index all of them. We don't index any of the columns specially. One of the big flaws in the Postgres optimizer is the lack of information about correlations between multiple columns. We've talked about that. It is on the to-do list. It's something that we have not really understood how to efficiently generate such correlation and use. Um, that, that is one of, the, one of the flaws, I think, and one of the areas we have to, we have to improve uh, is the correlation between columns. Sometimes if you say, this is 1 and this is 12, that may be a very rare case. And we're going to look at each one individually, which is unfortunate. So kind of get limited benefit out of multi-column indexes? No. Uh, so the question is, do we get limited benefit out of multi-column indexes? You still get a, a big benefit from them. It's just that you don't, the statistics are perhaps not as smart. But you're still going to be able to look up and filter across multiple columns. In fact, if you have a col an index on A, B, and C, and you, you give us A and C, we'll still use the index on A and C in some trickery that we have to kind of span gaps. And I'm not even going to go into it. But uh, multi-column indexes are certainly very useful. Yeah. It, not as useful for planning, well, but, so, but it, uh, yeah, but it, it, probably will, it probably still will. And the other thing that, that you get into in this case is that none of these numbers are perfect. All, they're all fudgy numbers. And in fact, even if I had the perfect number today, right now, five minutes from now, it would be wrong. Okay? So the point is that these, these estimates, they don't have to be perfect. They just need to be good enough to pick a plan that's probably closest to the best plan. Um, so that's probably good enough. Uh, trying to get perfect numbers wouldn't a, be efficient and b, wouldn't be probably very useful. <coughs> That's correct. The more indexes you have, the more possible combinations it has to look for. You're, you're, you're right, but we also have, and I, and I don't know, Bruce certainly got it in his talk, is the bitmap, right? Um, bitmap <coughs> that we have, where you can take, so the, the problem with the ABC index, right, is that if you want to look up based on C, you, it's, not, it's useless to you, sure. right? But what you do instead is you create independent indexes on A, B, and C, and then we're able to actually use the index on A and the index on C at the same time. Right. Yeah, you can, like this is yeah, showing yeah. it combined together. Bitmap, you can combine them together. So that's, that's where you would generally, you know, want to, that's what you want to generally do, I think. I mean, there are specialized cases where you will want an ABC index, uniqueness constraints and things like that. And yes, it can be useful for, you know, like, it'll be faster than bitmap, you know, than bitmap based stuff. But at the same time, if you're not sure exactly what the query pattern is going to look like, Okay. Now I'm going to stop the discussion there okay. uh, because we do want to we do want to finish the the material. Um, so the second thing that we want to talk about is what we call join method. Uh, and again, this is fairly common for most of the um, most of the relational systems. There are actually several, there are actually four different join methods or three and a half different join methods you can use. Uh, the first one's nested loop with two types of that. Third, second one's hash join, and the third one's merge join. I'm going to show you examples of that and diagrams of each of those. 
Okay, so we're going to have to create another sample table. This time I'm going to pull some rows from PGProc that happen to be numbers. Um, and I'm going to create a sample one, which pulls rows from PGProc. And then I'm going to create another table called sample two, which pulls some OIDs from PG class. Again, nothing super exciting. You can, you know, you'll, this is in that SQL file. Uh, I'm assuming, I'm going to start out with no indexes and no statistics. Okay, so I'm starting off with absolutely the worst case that we could do, right? So if I do this query with a where clause that's comparing sample one to a constant, and I'm joining sample one to sample two, I get what is called a nested loop with a sequential scan and a sequential scan. It looks just like this. It's as bad as it looks. It means compare every row to every other row. Now, the only reason this could be a win is if you have very small tables and there's no setup required. Okay? So very small joins potentially will use this because it's super fast. All right? And it looks like that. What if I join, what if I restrict sample two to be greater than some number, not equal, greater? I get what's called a hash join. Okay? And a hash join effectively says take one side and hash it and then do lookups from the other table into that hash. This is super, super popular. It's sort of the vanilla bean ice cream of, of databases. They love doing this, okay? Middle of the road kind of joint. And as long as one of the tables fits in memory, you're good, okay? It looks like that. But what if I do a join with no restriction at all? Then I get something called a merge join. And I have to sort, in fact, in this case, this is what a merge join looks like. It says, take the first row of the first table compared to the first row of the second table. Then if that matches, go to the, keep the first row of the first table compared to the second row. If that doesn't match, then you can move down and compare the second row to the second row. And then the second row to the third row. If that matches, keep going. Second row to fourth row. If that doesn't match, go down to the third row of the first table. You got to match. What you're effectively doing is you're walking the two tables simultaneously. Okay? So you're kind of advancing the one table and then advancing the other table, kind of moving down. One scan through each side of the table. This is great for large tables because it doesn't have to fit in memory and you're not multiple scanning it as you would uh, you know, in, an, in, a, in an, a nested loop. Okay? Um, so this is really, really useful. And again, you see it for big results. And it looks like that in pseudocode. Now, what if I change the order? Because before I did sample one join sample two, now I'm doing sample two join sample one. Doesn't matter. Does not matter. In most cases, the uh, most the smaller relation, the more restrictive relation, is on the outer side, and then um, you just run your merge join uh, the same way. Now, if I add statistics, okay. I'm going to expect to see a change because now the optimizer has some clue of what's going on. It has some clue of how many rows are there. It has, I think it already kind of knew how big the table was. It didn't go how many rows. And it knows how selective some of the constants are. So for example, here now, this one used to be a merge join. This uh, join, remember, with no where clause. This was a merge join. Now it's a hash join because it realizes, you know, these tables aren't that big. It's going to fit in memory. Now I got statistics to prove it. I'm going to do a hash join, okay? And um, if I do, uh, even if I do an outer join, which you think couldn't use a hash join, we can still do something called a hash left join, which is kind of weird. Uh, not a lot of databases support it. We do new in Postgres 91, okay? Um, what about cross join? You've probably never seen that before. Um, a cross join is basically saying join every row to every other row, and what? possible optimizer join method could this use, it's got to be the nested loop because that's the one that compares everything to everything else. There's nothing else that could do a cross join. Um, so you can even see when you do something that you would think would use a cross join, in fact, it does a cross join. Now, let's layer something else on top. Let's create an index on both fields. So now we've created an index on both tables. I'm sorry, not both tables, both, both tables. And again, we're going to get some different decisions from the optimizer that we didn't get before. Um, so here we have um, the case where we're comparing it to a constant. Um, and what, 
now happens is we still have a nested loop, but the nested loop is much faster because we're now able to look up the 33 with the index. So instead of having to compare every row to every other row, now I can zoom right into each table and say, just give me the 33s. I don't care about the other rows. And it looks exactly like this. So it basically uses an index to find all the 33s here, and then it joins it using an index lookup to all the 33s on the other end. So again, nest, a lot of people see index uh, nested loop, and they're like, uh, uh, uh. well, if you got an index there, nested loop isn't necessarily bad because you're not joining every row to every other row. You're just joining every row that matches the index to every other row that matches the index. And again, this is a double index scan. You can get cases where you have a sequential scan here and an index scan here. The point is you want the index scan on the inner side, on the bottom. Whether it's on the top or not, eh, it's better to have it, but you don't have to have it. Um, but again, if you don't have an index at the bottom, then you're going to be scanning every table, every row, to find a match. And that, that can get slow, particularly for large tables. Um, OK? Um, so that's what that looks like. So um, what about a query restriction? Now, this is, gets a little more into statistics. Do you remember way back when we started, 25, 30 minutes ago, I put some junk in the column. Do you remember that? And I put like 200 Xs. I just, the, the original table design I did, I'm back to, the, I'm back to this one where I, where I created it here. Um, this back up here, right. So this is 250 X's here, and to the second column is 250 X's here. So if I go in and I say, okay, um, tell me how many A's. Give me a join, and this has to be all A's. Now, as you remember, I put X's in there. And the optimizer actually know that there's no A's there. But it, you know, it, it kind of takes my word for it. And it says, OK, I'm going to assume there's one A matching here. And I'm going to assume there's one A matching there. Statistics tell me zero, but I'll assume one. OK? So it even knows for a non-indexed column how selective that is. And it does affect what it ends up doing in terms of joins and in terms of index lookups. Okay? If I do the same thing, but I ask for x's, that's completely different. Right? Remember, nested loop it uses when it knows, ah, I'm not going to get any rows of that. It's going to be small. Right? But when I'm doing this with the x's, then it says, OK, I'm going to do a hash join, and I'm going you know, to pull up my pants. This is going to be, you know, we're going to get some rows here. And you can see the row counts are pretty significant. Okay, So again, it's, it, it knows a lot of stuff, and it adjusts for you. Uh, last thing I want to cover uh, before I take questions is the idea of a limit clause. Uh, many of you have probably seen limit clause. Originally came from MySQL, very common now. Uh, it effectively allows you to tell the optimizer how many rows you want. Now, before the limit clause, people would use um, they would effectively use cursors, if you've ever used cursors before. Um, the reason we don't recommend cursors is because cursors effectively, um, effectively tell the query to run, but they don't really tell the optimizer how many rows in the future you're going to ask for. But when you use a limit clause, you're telling the optimizer, you know, I want you to run that query, and I really am telling you at the time you get the query, not some later time, at the time you get the query, I only want X number of rows. So here we're running the same query again, nowhere clause, hash join. It knows it's going to return a lot of rows, 260 in this case. Um, however, what if I say limit one? I say run that query, but optimizer, I really only want one row from that. All of a sudden, the optimizer can use an index that exists on the table, can pull things up, and instead of a hash join, now I'm doing a nested loop. Okay? What if I ask for 10 rows? Still a nested loop. It still thinks it's faster to do a nested loop with an index scan, pull those rows based on the order by. Okay? Um, uh, what if I say 100? Uh, 100, uh, okay. Now we're, now we're back to where we were before. So you see what I'm saying? 1 was a nested loop, 10 was a nested loop, 100, okay, we're back to hash join. Now I think I'm returning too many rows. 
So another, again, another example of how the optimizer is sort of using those smarts to adjust what it's doing to figure out basically how to get um, uh, the answers to you as quickly as possible. Okay? So that does finish my talk. I have plenty of time for questions. In fact, four minutes. I'm going to turn the lights on. I wish there was a, a, like a, a dimmer I could use on this, but it's, it's kind of scary. Um, but I'm, I know, I know, I know. I feel like I've just woken everyone from, from a nap. You know, my kids get up. We've got to go to school. Um, I'm ready, I can take any questions people have. Yes, sir. Um, Stephen, we haven't even repeated the question yet, so, okay. So the question is, and I'm sure the people in the back did not hear it, um, is that he's had trouble with uh, explain or getting optim the optimizer to, to properly process partition tables, where you've got a parent and you've got children. Now, uh, there have been some improvements in recent versions of Postgres, because in the, uh, the, the problem is that you t often are querying just the parent table, and the parent table doesn't have any statistics on it, whereas the, the actual children are the ones that have the data and have the statistics. So we've made some improvements in that, in trying to figure out like how selective it is, but I would say we're still not all the way there, um, and I think there's still need for improvement in there. So if you're having trouble, I, I understand it has to do with the way that we, the way the statistics, now what version of Postgres was this? Okay, so you're, well, you have everything we've released. I don't think a 9.4 has any improvements for partition tables. Not, not, um, so. so. Not in the way you're, at, you're talking about. I, I think what, so this is what I was trying to get at. I just wanted to clarify the question. Is the problem that you're having that the explaining it's not doing, like it's a huge, right, it's actually not doing executes doing is, it, it's actually running a lot faster, but it, it means that us like doing performance tuning where we're oh. trying to use explain repeatedly to Oh, yeah, the explain is going to, yeah. It shows you all the filter, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No. Actually, the query that you see up here, that little function I did, actually does explain in a function and then filters the rows coming out. So you might want to like create a custom function in your like site where you actually run explain in a function and again you can grab the code and then you can filter through it. Mr. Hip, yes. Um, is there any way to get a hint to the optimizer? So you have two terms sure. are correlated, but but you know your your statistics are trying to get correlation with your application that is correlated. Right. Are there hints that you can get it to tell it to the local so we have had a long discussion over the value of hints. Some vendors support them, some vendors don't. Some vendors have supported them and then don't want to support them anymore um, because they, 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 they can be used very efficiently in, in cases where the optimizer just doesn't understand enough about the data model. But there also are cases where it can be very misused and actually contort the thing. So we've always had the debate about that. We, we do have some ability to mark columns in a table based on their selectivity. So normally, when you're looking at a query that's not running right, the problem is not the query. So putting the hint in the query is not the problem. The problem is really that the optimizer doesn't have proper data in the statistics. So we're trying to move to a model where we basically are, hint, are, are giving that detailed information that the analyze can't pick up on the specific columns versus spreading them out all through the, app, the application. And I, I think we're still in the process of working through that. And we're, we're, we're really hesitant to add hints in a way that would be perhaps misused before we get that in place, I would think is the short answer. I probably have moved for one more question. Somebody who hasn't answered, yes. Well, question, when you're running yeah. So when you, can you tell from the explain whether it's using statistics or not? That's a great question. I don't think you can. And, and that's actually an interesting concept that you would perhaps give a message to say, hey, I don't have any. Well, I, I think we probably should do something like that, but you can kind of tell the default values. Right? And 
Yeah, but that's, yeah, that's it's not, not great, yeah, that's kind of goofy. Uh, let me take the one question up top there. Thank you. So how does doing a stored procedure that runs a function? So um, how does it change what's going on? Effectively, when you're in a stored procedure and you run a query, oh, okay. are you worried about the statistics of the rows returned from the function? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the procedure itself, when it's running queries, the full optimizer is, is, in, is in place. So every query that's in that stored procedure is getting fully optimized exactly with this process. If that stored procedure returns a result, there are very poor statistics of what is actually returned from that function that's given to us as an optimizer. When you create the function, you can actually specify an estimate of how many rows are going to come out of it. And that actually can be useful for the optimizer if you're having trouble with a query that has a function that isn't being optimized properly. I think there's still a lot more we can do, but that's what we have now. So uh, I want to thank you very much. I am unfortunately out of time. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.